All right, retroperitoneal fibrosis. So here you can see there's bilateral hydronephrosis, otherwise not much to see here at that higher level, but lower down, you can see this ill-defined soft tissue density uh, surrounding the aorta and clearly involving the ureters. And that's what this does. This is known as Ormond syndrome. It can be uh, just an isolated pathology and it can be associated sometimes with ergotamine derivatives. So people who have been treated for migraines uh, will sometimes get develop this. Uh, the important thing to note here is that this soft tissue density does not surround the aorta, right? Because your differential here is retroperitoneal lymphoma. Lymphoma tends to go under the aorta between the aorta and the vertebral body, whereas retroperitoneal fibrosis will stay on the anterior and lateral aspects of the aorta. You can sometimes get some capsular thickening and even inflammatory stranding surrounding the kidneys as well. So this doesn't just involve the periaortic region uh, and ureters, but in this case, obviously it does. But if you see a little fuzz around the kidneys themselves, that can still be retroperitoneal fibrosis. All right. So that said, there is a differential on what are called hairy kidneys, and this is an unusual disorder, but I thought I'd throw it in there just uh, for the oddity value. Uh, this patient has periaortic density, which in this situation is referred to as a coated aorta. Certainly, you can have aortic aortitis, inflammatory or infectious, that will look like this. I've got a few cases of Takayasu's arteritis that uh, make the aorta look pretty similar to this as well. So there is definitely a differential on a periaortic circumferential periaortic hypodensity. So you can see the spleen is infiltrated. It's very heterogeneous in appearance, pretty nonspecific, but certainly not a normal spleen. We're late enough in the contrast phase to say uh, there's something going on in that splenic parenchyma. And then lastly, perirenal density. Uh, so there's that coated aorta, and then these are referred to as hairy kidneys. So uh, I put this in as well to show you that that last case we saw, retroperitoneal fibrosis, the kidneys can look like this in retroperitoneal fibrosis as well. One funny thing, uh, just like the HIV nephropathy, I have a bunch of cases of retroperitoneal fibrosis. They're all non-contrast because so many of them present in renal failure. So this patient did not present in renal failure. That's why we get the contrast and we can really see uh, the distinction between the renal cortex and that hairy kidney. All right, so that is a coated aorta and hairy kidneys. There's splenic infiltration and also there is some airspace density, so there's most likely some lung parenchyma infiltration as well. So Erdheim-Chester is on that spectrum of longer Hans cell histiocytosis, so eosinophilic granuloma and uh, Hans Schuler Christian and Lederer Siwi. Uh, this is a part of that whole spectrum. So it's not neoplastic, it's not infectious probably some inflammatory component to it, but no one's really sure. So there's that splenic infiltration, hairy kidneys, and a coated aorta. That's a pretty unusual case. That's one I use for my uh, Jeopardy games as well. And we'll take a last look at the extent of pulmonary infiltration as well. All right, Erdheim-Chester disease. So this is a, a great case just of renal osteodystrophy to show you the skeletal, skeletal changes in chronic renal failure. So you have essentially moth-eaten looking bones. They're both sclerotic and hypodense. And it's that bizarre combination that should always tip you uh, to thinking, oh, could this be renal osteodystrophy? 
This patient is far enough advanced that they have also developed brown tumors from a state of constant hyperparathyroidism. They ultimately will get these large masses of uh, skeletal cells that re represent the uh, rapid churn turnover of the skeletal system. Okay, so here you can see the kidneys are shrunken down to little nubbins consistent with this patient's chronic renal disease. And then the sacroiliac changes uh, quite possibly can make me swoon. Right, you can see the iliac side subperiosteal resorption. We have that same phenomenon that we saw earlier. This one might have gotten so advanced that we've got a little fuzz on the sacral side as well. But you can see this is predominantly on the iliac side, and we've lost that thin pencil line of normal cortex. That happens in the sacroiliac joints. It also happens in the pubic synthesis. And then on the lateral, on the sagittal, we've got the banding appearance of a rugger jersey spine. You can see the end plates, the bone immediately under the end plates is a little denser and you've got a hypodense stripe going through the center of each of the vertebral bodies. So that's a rugger jersey spine. I honestly, that, that one is tough to pick up on plain film. I've only got one or two plain films from my whole 30 year career that really convincingly show a rugger jersey spine. And even on CT, it's really not that apparent. So this is the area where that brown tumor was developing in the posterior elements. And you can see here on the sagittal, it has almost completely replaced the posterior elements, spinous process and pedicles there uh, at that vertebral level. So there are those brown tumors. Atrophic kidneys. There is a calcified renal transplant, as if you didn't know this is a renal failure case. And then look at those sacroiliac joints, and the pubic synthesis is widened as well. Let that run one more time. It's pretty impressive. You know, you just don't see such advanced findings of renal osteodystrophy that often anymore because they've gotten a lot better at managing patients' uh, calcium phosphorus balance in dialysis. So it's, uh, it's really kind of rare that anyone gets to this point in this day and age. I can see I pulled this one uh, off my vitrea, which dates back, means it's at least 15 years old, uh, possibly older. Yeah, VRAD bought me a vitria. I used to joke with the residents that visited that my uh, backyard office was better equipped than their radiology department. All right. This one is a case of emphysematous cystitis. We've seen emphysematous pyelonephritis, uh, but this is emphysematous cystitis. And remember, in emphysematous pyelonephritis, we did see a little of the gas carried down into the bladder. You'll definitely recognize this is a different situation. So we've got an enlarged and obstructed kidney with hydronephrosis, renal enlargements, and perinephric stranding. And down here in the bladder, look at that. The entire bladder wall is filled with gas. It's pretty impressive. Again, this one, there's a little bit of gas in the uh, right kidney, but this one predominantly is restricted to the bladder. So this is a relatively more benign entity. Uh, again, I, I always saw uh, other radiologists saying, ah, that's nothing, it's just emphysematous cystitis. Well, they still do need treatment. This usually is post-infectious. Uh, so don't blow it off entirely as an utterly benign finding, but at the same time, it doesn't carry with it uh, the morbidity and mortality implications of emphysematous pyelonephritis. All right, so that's emphysematous cystitis. And this is one where it's everywhere. So you've got emphysematous pyelonephritis. It's involving both kidneys. Both kidneys appear obstructed, hydronephrotic, and there's perinephric stranding. There is ureteral 
mural emphysema. You don't see that very often at all, but clearly uh, this is tracking up or down the ureters. And then the bladder is very thick walled and full of intraluminal gas. So I think this probably started in the bladder, just given the extent of the wall thickening in the bladder, but it's honestly hard to say. This could have been a primary renal infection uh, that tracked down or a primary bladder infection that tracked up. And in spite of the gas, I see gas and I always go to my gas forming bacteria uh, list, but there are actually a lot of gas formers, uh, Klebsiella, Proteus, E. coli, there are versions of them all that can uh, be gas formers. And so uh, I was shocked to discover after a little more research into that, that gas forming doesn't help you really narrow the list of infectious possibilities as much as I thought it did in my internal medicine days. So really nice view of that uh, emphysematous ureteritis I've actually got a plain film where it was so bad you can you can even see it on plain film. So that's not an unheard of entity to have emphysematous ureteritis. Okay, so that is emphysematous cystitis, ureteritis, pyelonephritis. Okay, this is an infected uricus. This is uh, in a younger patient. You can see there is an umbilical fluid collection there, and it will extend into the abdomen, and there is basically a chain of lobulated uh, fluid collections that are all in line and lead you down to the bladder dome. So that allows you to say this is a persistent uricus. And of course, these have a tendency to get super infected and there is uh, some predilection for bladder dome tumors of bizarre origin as well. So there is that fluid collection. You can see there are just little lobulated fluid collections in a string that leads you down to that bladder dome. This one's great on the sagittal. You can really appreciate it starting at the umbilicus and then these multiple fluid collections there extending down to the bladder dome, which is thickened. So there it is. These are hard to see a persistent uricus if they're not infected, but obviously you can see with the uh, fluid collections, the lobulation, the thick walls and very inflamed looking, right? Quite fuzzy looking walls to this tract that all help you say that this is super infected. All right, so that is a super infected uracal remnant. Okay, this is a weird one. Uh, I just found this in our teaching file the other day, and I thought it was kind of funny. Uh, our radiologist put it in and said suboptimal outcome. Um, so this is a vaginoplasty, and I have to admit, I had an old friend who went off into plastic surgery. I saw him years later, and he said, yeah, I do vaginoplasties. I said, what is that? because it was a long time ago. And he said, oh, I can turn a penis into a vagina such that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And I thought, I don't believe it. Uh, so this patient had a vaginoplasty and there are a couple of things that went wrong. One is there's an abscess here at the base of the penis. So there is a, uh, an ill-defined fluid collection that in the post-operative state, this is about three days post-op, can be tough to tell from a hematoma, uh, but I think this patient presented with fever and they were pretty sure it was in fact an abscess. So there is residual, I believe that this is corpus spongiosum because of its location, but it's hard to, they're, they're, the anatomic markers have been altered and so it's kind of hard to tell, but I believe that's probably residual corpus spongiosum, uh, could be uh, of course cavernosa as well. So you can see there is a little residuum and that actually, uh, our radiologist reading this said, that's a suboptimal outcome as well. Uh, supposedly in the perfect situation, that is removed as well. And then lastly, there is a reconstructive vagina and you can see it's actually epithelialized. And so I look at this and say, oh my God, maybe this is possible. In fact, if I go back one, 
you can see there's a little uh, clitoral nub in there uh, where the labia are meeting. And so they probably did do a pretty good job of reconstructing this. I was shocked to discover, looking at this objectively, that uh, this might actually uh, might actually work. So there is that fluid collection at the base of the penis. That's most likely an abscess. And those residual corpora. And then there is the reconstructed vagina. So that is quite a case. <laughs>